Rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, or have learnt to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are fragrant offering and acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory for ever and ever. Amen. And the final greetings. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray as we look at what Paul has to say about this today. Gracious God, we thank you that as we come before you, as we hear from people who have been your saints uh, for years before we have, there is so much that we have to learn and so much you have to teach us. We pray that as we, uh, as we open uh, this passage this morning at the end of Philippians, that you will indeed bless us with your presence and your teaching and that, you, that we may respond with our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you read this morning's, as Ray read this morning's um, passage this morning, it's kind of a thank you note. You know, uh, often when I was uh, out travelling with Scripture Union, I'd go to all sorts of different places around the, country, around the, the state and uh, be, often somebody would put me up uh, just somewhere in their home and uh, uh, particularly in the country, they often had lovely guest rooms for me to stay in and uh, almost without variation, I would leave them a little note to say thanks for, uh, thanks for being, your, being a, such a generously hospitable host. And this, this was almost like that. They've received a gift so again, after a, particularly after weddings these days. We still send out thank you gifts. This, uh, this morning's passage says a number of the usual things. It says, it's great to hear from you and to know you've been concerned for me and how concerned you've been for me. I know you, you've been concerned even though you really hadn't had the opportunity to, to show it. And also know it's not the first time. What a wonderful gift you have given to me. And all that's pretty standard gratitude stuff, isn't it? A pretty standard, a pretty standard thank you, really, right? But Paul also says a couple of things that could almost make him sound ungrateful. He says he wasn't actually in need. In fact, he's pretty content. He didn't really want the gifts that they sent. It's almost like going to someone's place for dinner and after the meal they say, thank you so much, you've been so generous, such a lovely meal. But actually I ate before, so you didn't need to give me anything. How well would that go down? Probably not so well. You can understand why they could even found, sound a little bit um, offensive, even a lot. Is that Paul's intention here? Well, no, I don't think it is. 
I think he's actually trying to uh, teach a deeply profound message that still resonates today. Remember again who Paul is writing to. He's writing to the church in Philippi. This mecca for retired uh, war heroes, military heroes, who have made their reputation in the Roman army and continue to dine out on it in this city. Uh, and now either they've become landowners or have received a decent payout as their severance pay from the Roman army, from Caesar himself. They've got more than enough to live on. And what does it worry them that they give a bit of it away to poor old Paul over there in Rome? But Paul, Paul doesn't see himself as poor. Even in his precarious circumstances, sitting there in prison, waiting to see whether he'll make it to tomorrow. Let's look at those verses, verse 12 to 13 again. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content. In any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Just think about that. You have, I have everything I could ever need because I've learned the secret of being content even with nothing. Why? How? Because of Jesus. You might have seen to the Philippians that Paul lost his mind. You know, sitting there in jail all that time, it's just started to mess with his, mess with his upstairs. Or even that he's giving false encouragement just for them to feel okay about the fact of where he is and not be distracted by his suffering. But I actually think he's teaching them an invaluable lesson that is still relevant today. So think about this with me. I think for most Christians, they and we have confidence that whatever we have, whether we're rich or poor, good health or bad, that God cares for us and that he will look after us no matter where we are. And we'd also say that God does. We can trust God to look after our needs. But then, three years ago, the stock market took a battering. Then a year ago, interest rates started to creep up and creep up and creep up. And uh, if most people if faith were asked what their reaction was to that, I think if we're honest, we probably would have responded with concern. I'm not just talking about people who are weak in their faith. Even I pause for a moment just to think about what's going to happen with our superannuation. I'm sure there are others who would be the same. And why do we do that? Why, when we trust God to look after us, will we be reacting with fear? As that Year 9 student posited a few years ago? Perhaps the answer is this. Of course we would say, we would almost all say that we trust God with our salvation, with our prayers. But do we still trust him with everything? Everything we need? Or are we really saying that we will do what needs to be done to provide for ourselves and our families and God's just the backup plan? At the end of the day, are we just seeing God as a massive safety blanket? I think the problem with that's quite serious. Because when, then we will see that the things that we have provided or accumulated, they're ours. We own them. They're all mine. I've saved, I've invested them. And when it comes to God, well, he can have whatever I want to give him. Whatever I have left over after I've done all the things I want to do. Be it my time, be it my energies, be it my finances. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. Even the fact that we have our faculties, our common sense, as I said before, to have those things at our disposal is entirely because God gave us those faculties. They are his gifts to us. 
We need to, I think in, in our, this time and age, we need to rethink with all that we have, are we thinking of it as being ours? Or are we thinking of the, those things as being gifts of God, given to us, entrusted to us for a time? And start with the question, well, what does he want to do with it? What would God have me do with what I have, what I am, and what I can be for the future? It takes us to the other side of it as well. Why then are some people with nothing so happy? I spent some time in the Philippines. And uh, I think I've talked about this before. We uh, had workers who would turn up and they'd be, uh, they'd be ready to go for the day. They were excited to be part of what we're going to do that day, uh, to learn new things um, and spend time with me, a Westerner, who really had nothing, no idea of what they would do from day to day themselves. It was my first experience of working with people from another culture. And uh, as we came together, they were beautifully dressed. They were immaculately um, prepared for the day. It gave no hint at all of the fact that they probably woke up under a shanty in the middle of living under a bridge for many of them, under a sheet of iron, and that was their shelter last night. They still turned up beautifully. But they were so they came across as being so happy. They knew that, uh, that they were loved, they knew that they had people around them, and for that day they had work. In fact, some of them for a year would have work. They knew that much. In our time, so many are trying to make sure that they can reach the next milestone, the next pay rate, the next level of service, the next job, even the next holiday. More is the catch cry of the media. Why would you be settled? Why would you be happy with sufficient when you could have more? I mean, they have to ask us to, get, to aim for more. How else are they going to sell their goods? It's the hook of so many of those rotten gambling ads these days. Every media service it seems to have them. And in so many ways, we've lost the value of the very thing that Paul hints at in his letter. He uses one word content and the problem is this idea of more that's even infected our church at times but the reality is that God doesn't promise more and more and more and more not for Paul not for us in this life he offers enough what is the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray Give us today our daily bread. Give us enough for this day so that we might get to the next. It takes me to, to, the, um, uh, to the, uh, that uh, favourite saint of so many, Francis of Assisi. Not sure how many of you know his story. How many of you know the story of Francis of Assisi? A few of you? That's great. You can tell me what I got wrong. He came from a pretty rich family. His father had his own business um, and he was quite well to do. And he had a, and he, trying to find himself as a young person, he made a few mistakes. And he was called by, eventually called by God to be a monk. He began his, uh, began his order of monks. And rather than just being solemn people, just hung, hanging around a monastery, they used to tour around, kind of like the troubadours of the day, travelling musicians, all around the region, uh, talking about Jesus. They weren't solemn and serious, but full of joy. And people were amazed at the mismatch between two obvious truths. Obviously, they were in poverty, but obviously they were genuinely happy about it because they had all they need. What an eye-popping testimony that is. Greater than any words would say. They were taking that from the, the example of Paul here in the Philippians. They're also talking about the Christ who didn't even try to keep his divinity or even his life 
for our sake. So how should we think of all that God has blessed us with? Ultimately, what we do with our finance, what we do with our time, what we do with our energy, that'll be determined by, should be determined by, how much we rejoice in Christ. If we know for ourselves how wide and deep and vast God's love for us is, and we want to see that love makes its way into the hearts and minds of souls uh, of many more and wants to keep on doing so, it'll be reflected in our uh, in our actions. It'll be reflected in our giving, in how we spend our time, as we support and in, are involved in the ministry of the gospel. It's reflected by the giving of the Philippians to support Paul and his ministry, and it's reflected week by week by some here who give very generously from what they have in time, in service, and in finance, sometimes incredibly sacrificially. So let me finish by adding my voice to Paul's. For my part, I would love for you all to consider that you might give to gospel ministry through our congregation. As I said before, I'm working with the church council to kickstart some great things in the mission of Jesus through this congregation going forward. And I genuinely hope that we will grow in our generosity as a congregation to support God's work and that we would do that sacrificially. After all, it's God's in the first place. But don't want us to do that because we think God is making us do it out of any sense of obligation. And not even just because there's a need to, there to be met. I want you to consider how much more you want to be involved because you rejoice, rejoice in what God has done for you. What he will keep on doing for us, all of us, and what he's able to do for so many others by the power of his gospel. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to be engaged in things that you are doing in the world. Thank you that we can play a part in things that might last for eternity. Lord, it is easy for us to, uh, to be worried about what we have worried about what, we've, what, we, uh, what we can do with what we have, uh, worry about our means, worry about our very lives. But Lord, thank you that they are all in your hands. And what better hands could we put them in? So Lord, we pray that we would, you would teach us how you would best have us uh, deploy ourselves in your service. We pray that as we do so, we might see your kingdom come here on heaven as it is, uh, here, here on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.